thanks, Mike, for that uh, very nice introduction. Um, I'm not going to do a PowerPoint today, um, and um, I want to uh, try to give our overview uh, of sort of where we're coming from in, as Tennessee and, and really address some of the questions uh, someone asked back here about sort of the challenges and opportunities uh, with TBA and its unique role as uh, really 99% percent plus percent, 0.7% percent of our uh, power generation in the state and sort of the challenges and opportunities that presents. Um, as Mike mentioned, I am the, the president of ECOS, which is my 50 state counterparts, but since we're tweeting this all over the world, I am not speaking on behalf of ECOS as there's obviously a variety of opinions uh, among our members about the plan uh, and uh, actions moving forward. So um, I will h highlight you know, sort of some of the general issues that we're talking about, uh, but just in case somebody's listening out there, it, it uh, uh, is, I'm speaking sort of our observations uh, and, and also my perspective, not, as Mike said, not only as, as the current state regulatory official, but just my background in the Clean Air Act and having done 111 uh, plans before. I was actually, it was so long ago that EPA used 111D. Uh, I was actually at the agency back in the early 90s when the last time it used 111D uh, for a regulatory mechanism. Uh, and as Ken very uh, correctly pointed out, it is a little bit different than uh, the standard state implementation plan where uh, you're shooting for an ambient number and, and there's things very pres prescriptive in the statute about the kind of control measures and stuff. Um, and then what's really unique about this 111D we'll get into uh, is it really goes beyond the sort of traditional looking at a point source. Sta Section 111 is a new source performance standard program for stationary sources and, and, and the way the rule is structured, as, as you uh, probably know, through the building blocks, it, it goes beyond sort of looking at an end of the stack uh, number and control. Um, so that's um, just to give you a, uh, a observation. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit generally about sort of our process in developing our comments on the rule and then what we would anticipate going forward as EPA moves to finalize uh, its regulatory action later this summer. Um, we, uh, as many of you know, EPA did a lot of extensive outreach um, prior to proposal, which is somewhat uncommon. Um, they usually have some meetings, but they went to extensive efforts. And, and whatever you think about the proposed rule, I think everybody would agree um, that you have to give EPA credit for soliciting extensive input uh, to the proposal um, through stakeholder meetings and webinars and one-on-one -on -one meetings and, and with various groups and perspectives. And I think that helped shape um, the proposal. And one of the clear things that I think uh, all the ECOS members were, uh, all the states were um, supportive of uh, as they move forward is, and what's unique about this rule is, there's not one number that every state has a different target because they recognize that states were starting in very, very different places. Some, as Ken alluded to, have little or no uh, uh, electricity uh, power generation from coal-fired plants. Others are, uh, like Kentucky, 90 plus percent dependent on coal-fired. So the expectations since the technology, and I don't know how much you uh, didn't get here at the very beginning in terms of the broad overview of the statute of best system of emission reduction and best demonstrated technology, uh, whatever phrase you want to use historically, um, you have to make a determination that that technology is feasible. So that broad thing uh, is uh, EPA is to be commended at least starting in different um, uh, starting points in terms of what they thought was reasonable for the states to do moving forward under you know one or all of the building blocks. Um, so they did do that, so there's literally uh, 58 or 48 uh, different numbers. Uh, and then there's some discussion, I think uh, Ken highlighted that question about how do you picking one number, um, uh, or one year rather, not one number, but one year as a baseline number. Traditionally, they do an average or something. And the particular concern I think that Tennessee had and some other states is we've been talking fairly um, uh, in, this, uh, in this country fairly seriously for about the last 10 years about carbon reduction. If you had asked folks back in early 2000s, uh, it would, the only question was whether we're going to have a carbon tax or whether we're going to have a cap and trade legislation. So many utilities like TVA and others started moving knowing regulatory 
program was coming in, or a legislative uh, mandate in one shape or another, so they tried to get ahead of the game um, and start making carbon reductions and look, making investment decisions about whether to reinvest in their coal, existing coal-fired plants, build new coal-fired plants, shift to nuclear power or shift to uh, natural gas or, or other or renewables or other low or zero carbon emissions. Um, and that, that shift or that, um, obviously, if you're, if you're a utility, uh, whether you're investor-owned or a TVA utility um, uh, public power, you're going to make investment decisions uh, in early on based on what's the cheapest thing to do. So you're going to get the lowest hanging fruit in terms of carbon reductions first. Um, that's just rational economic sense. So TVA and others who made early reductions um, uh, have gotten those investments made and, and got some of the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, in terms of those carbon reductions. Not that any of those were cheap, but, but relatively speaking, making those decisions. So as the President announced and the plan talked about is the goal was to make a 30 percent reduction um, from the 2005 um, baseline. And, and even some of the public reports when their first proposal came out, everybody was assuming that was the target. You know, from 2005, what are states going to be asked to do? But until you got into the details of the rule, and real quick, it really was 2012, just this uh, random number, random year um, that was based on, well, that's the last year we had full data. Um, and as you know, in 2012, we were still, still uh, in an economic downturn. We were just starting to come back out of that. So, as Ken highlighted, there were lots of different things. So a number of utilities that sort of stepped up and started making investment choices in the mid-2000s. Um, and just to highlight that, TVA has since 2005, in the last 10 years, till 2013 or 14, made an over a 30 percent reduction in their carbon emissions. Well, and again, the first press reports, everybody sat back and said, well, Tennessee's in great shape because if we have to make a 30 percent reduction in our carbon emissions since 2005, we're there. Um, well, lo and behold, that wasn't the case. Um, and in fact, um, it's a disincentive, um, and this is the, the regulatory policy issue that really goes beyond 111D um, in, in whether it's air, water, or waste uh, regulations going forward is if people start making decisions and investments and, and investors making utilities uh, investments uh, on utilities or any other regulated entity about um, in advance of the actual mandate to do something, um, and then they essentially get disadvantaged because of that, who in the future is going to step out ahead um, unless there are other independent reasons to make meet those requirements um, because they're now, they're essentially now TVA and other utilities that stepped out ahead. While the, the overall goal of making those, those carbon reductions is done, it makes the job going forward because now TVA has to make another 30 plus percent reduction in their carbon emissions um, unless the, the baseline and the target numbers are changed in the final rule. So as a big picture policy perspective, that's certainly something we brought to TVA's, I mean to EPA's attention. Uh, in the proposal, in the discussions um, about, you know, what, what first just in this rule, are you incenting uh, sort of re perverse behavior here? Of why would anybody do anything unless they absolutely have to? And certainly the spillover effect to other future regulatory uh, re requirements when you're trying to incent people to act voluntarily. That they typically in the air toxics program, for example, if you made early reductions and got reductions of air toxics ahead of schedule or before the proposed rule, you got credit for those in terms of what you ultimately had to do in terms of meeting those reductions. So there's a very unusual sort of uh, oddity here in terms of uh, what EPA has, has done with the proposal. Um, in terms of our comments, as I said, we filed extensive comments. You can find them online at EPA docket. I'm happy to send anybody those comments directly. Um, but in framing those comments, one of the things we did as a state agency uh, is do somewhat the same kind of extra uh, stakeholder engagement. Uh, we participated in um, forums at the Baker Center at UT and other forums around the state, uh, individual stakeholder meetings of folks that expressed interest to talk about um, the proposal. Uh, we met extensively uh, with EPA, both one-on-one, -on -one, uh, where we went through specifics about the Tennessee numbers. Um, as well as their webinars and outreach. And again, um, through ECOS uh, and EPA, uh, they had a number of those kind of listening sessions or discussion sessions to gather more input in addition to the 
uh, multiple public hearings that EPA did across the, uh, the state once the proposed rule came out. Um, uh, so uh, we tried to reach that and, and, and take those into comments. Um, as somebody alluded to, we are very unique, and I think I agree with Ken, it provides us some challenges and opportunities in that we basically have one electricity supplier in the state, one power. Uh, we do not have a public service commission that sets rates. TVA sets rates by themselves uh, in terms of what their rates are and then pass through. The rates are actually charged by the local, you know, Nashville Electoral Service or Knoxville Utilities Board, whoever. Um, and that's the other challenge is um, not all utilities are this way, but many utilities are vertically integrated. So particularly when you get to the topic of energy efficiency and demand side reduction, the ability to control or have influence on those local energy efficiency uh, control measures um, that you might want to take credit for in your 111D plan are, if you're vertically integrated and you generate the power and you're dealing with the consumer and con consent behavior, um, you have opportunities and you can um, recover uh, costs um, better. Uh, I think it's generally well accepted for, by most utility uh, electricity generators that uh, efforts at reducing demand and uh, output are cheaper <laughs> investments right now than building uh, additional capacity, regardless of almost what kind of capacity that is. Um, but for the local distributor who is selling that electricity but doesn't have to generate, they're, at, they're very different incentives for their behavior. It would be sort of like saying we have too much traffic in Nashville and asking Nissan to stop making more cars. I mean, it's just, you know, it's asking, unless they can recover the cost of those energy efficiency programs um, that they invest in that, by selling less, less electricity, they're getting less revenue and their infrastructure costs, their cost of you know, providing service delivery trucks and, and taking care of the local lines and all of that infrastructure is capitalized and spread out over the, the kilowatts or megawatts that they sell. Um, and if you sell 20% less, um, you have less opportunity. Essentially, your rates have to go up to recover those overhead costs as well. So that's a challenge, as I said, it's an opportunity. And because we don't have a public service commission that can say, to that local um, electric power uh, company, well, we'll let you recover all of those costs um, as part of that effort because e uh, TVA is actually setting the rates. So that's one of the real challenges uh, and opportunities that Tennessee face. And because we don't have merchant power capability, if you sell power with or generate power within the Tennessee Valley service area, and that includes not only Tennessee but p pieces of several other states, you have to sell, you either can use the power yourself, and that's fine if you generate, you know, a solar power panel or something. Otherwise, you have to sell it into the grid. Essentially, you have to sell it to TVA. So they control the market for new renewables or anything else, um, unless you do essentially uh, behind, the, behind the meter uh, self generation for your own consumption. You can reduce your capacity or your, or your purchase from, from TVA. But um, because of the way the statute, uh, Congress created TVA, uh, and, and, and its economic development role, the trade-off was to give them essentially a monopoly of the market. In other venues, um, if the electric power, if wind power, renewable power, or some other source of power, uh, natural gas, you, people can sell that directly to, to customers uh, or sell it to the utility um, or use it themselves. So there's a lot of different little unique things uh, that present, uh, uh, in many cases, challenges uh, and can highlighted the reverse, um, that TVA, because it's, while it's a private government corporation, which nobody really ever figures out, they're a government when they want to be and they're not, they're a private sector. <laughs> I mean, they have a CEO, they technically have a board that is appointed by the president, nominated and confirmed by the Senate, but they really kind of operate very independently. Um, so, and they have, they're not just a power company, they have all their stewardship responsibilities in managing uh, the waterways and stuff. So, uh, but loosely, yes, I think there's, um, some connection that they as a board um, are appointed by the president and have some accountability to, to uh, his public policy goals um, in this context. So it puts them in a rather unique position because they're being compared all the time to Southern Company and Duke and other investor-owned utilities, yet they're not really, because they're not just a utility company, they have all these other stewardship and economic development and, and um, uh, responsibilities for the for the waterways that they they cover those costs. So those are a couple of just broad observations about 
the, the proposal and the challenges and, and the unique um, situation that Tennessee's in um, with respect to TVA. But really many of those issues, um, you know, most states in some ways you could say it's more of a challenge if you're in another state that has six different utility companies operating in and trying to look at how you bring a plan together that covers uh, you know, six different owners of your, of your uh, uh, electric coal fired or, or natural gas generating units. You have more challenges there. Um, the other challenge practically from a state standpoint looking at a plan, and it suggests looking at some regional planning, but you know, we serve, TVA serves a very, very small piece of other states, um, is the multi-state effect. Um, TVA looks at its investment decisions by and large and its allocation of resources um, and its uh, efforts to reduce carbon on a system-wide basis of which Tennessee is only a piece of that. So, um, we, and, th and this is the one probably disconnect with each state having a different number. Um, Kentucky has huge challenges and has um, uh, significant uh, reliance on coal. So if TVA, if I'm TVA, the investor, and I'm looking about where the best bang for the buck in terms of getting credit for, it might be that it's more efficient and more cost effective to do some kind of reduction in, particularly on energy efficiency programs in Kentucky because their number is so dependent on coal-fired capacity, which means they wouldn't necessarily invest the resource in Tennessee. Well, if they're looking at a system approach, it doesn't matter. It all kind of washes out from TVA's perspective. But if Tennessee doesn't get the benefit of that investment because it's cheaper to make an investment at a coal-fired plant um, in terms of energy efficiency or a service area uh, in another state, um, there's, there's, there's a disconnect in the incentives there. Um, and, and frankly, if there was more time, I think more states would be looking at opportunities to sort of do a, do a concerted uh, team effort, um, at least a partial one, where we could take TVA and look at the service area and somehow allocate, you know, its reductions among, based on the capacity. And the, uh, the other reality is, you know, many plants, both in Alabama and, um, and uh, Kentucky, sir, you know, there's power going both ways across those state lines. There's nuclear and coal-fired capacity moving across. Um, so, you know, where exactly is it generated and where exactly it used in a grid system is going to be a challenge in terms of taking credits for those reductions. Um, a couple of other observations, um, again, uh, both as the regulator and, and somebody who's worked in the Clean Air Act area for a long time. Um, you know, the, the key definitions of source and stationary source and best system of emission reduction, as, as, as many of you probably read through the comments and the literature and the thousands of press articles, um, this is a very untraditional approach to look beyond, as the, as the saying has become, beyond the fence line for, for controls and activities that are outside the generating unit itself in terms of what, what your emission reductions, and that really leads to the building block. You know, building block one is really the, the physical coal-fired unit itself, um, and, and how you do that in terms of best system of emission reduction. And one of the challenges, one of the things we commented on in best system of emission reduction, I know most of you are familiar, there's the four building blocks. And what EPA did in the proposal is they looked at each of those building blocks independently to determine what was best system of emission reduction. So they said, well, you we think on average you can get 6% uh, improvements um, from existing coal-fired plants based on you know, some, some facilities that have done that. But then they said, well, we want you to increase your best system of emission reduction for natural the gas is to decrease capacity utilization at your coal fire and shift to increase natural gas because that's half the carbon uh, per megawatt. Um, and everybody can get 70% because we see, we see some folks getting 70% capacity factor. Set aside some discussions about whether that 70% is a good number. but. But it has the impact if you decrease capacity at your existing coal-fired units to get set up to 70% on your natural gas fire, your cost efficiencies of that 6% are jeopardized because you need to operate, again, to recover those efficiency improvements, you tend to operate that unit more. In, in the past, when people did those uh, efficiency improvements to reduce carbon at those units, 
they tended to operate them more to spread out the cost of those investments. So now if you're shifting, <laughs> decreasing capacity, so they didn't, do, they didn't really look at the interplay between building block one and building block two and says, well, if you shift the capacity to natural gas, what's your capacity factor now going to be of that unit? And then what's the cost effectiveness of making those energy efficiency improvements? So it will be very interesting to see how EPA, and I think a number of folks commented on that, as well as whether the 6% was a, was a reasonable target overall. Um, again, the assumption, as I said, if people over the last 10 years were looking for carbon reductions, they tended to make those improvements where it was most cost effective to do. So those folks that did get 6% um, probably were uh, units that were identified as being cost effective and were likely to be continue to operate for uh, a reasonable period of time to recapture that investment. If you're now moving down the, the food chain, so to speak, to less efficient or less effective units because you've already done some of those for those folks that got out ahead of the curve and looking at reductions, whether the cost effectiveness is, is, is you can get the 6% in a cost effective way. Because the best demonstrated technology does have to be take a cost uh, in, uh, into account since it's an existing source. So um, that's a real issue, the interplay between uh, particularly building blocks one and two on how you look at the cost effectiveness or whether it is a best system of emission reduction when you look at both. Nobody, if you take that to all four units, they, typically you do a best of system of emission reduction across the entire thing you're regulating uh, because you know, you know, in a typical facility, if you're decreasing, you know, air emissions, you may be increasing water or waste emissions and you have to balance those and what the cost effectiveness. If you're decreasing air emissions and investing but you're increasing your cost because you now have um, additional waste or water disposal, you have to look at that, uh, what's, what's best demonstrated technology considering other environmental impacts and stuff. And if you're only looking at it building block by building block, you may not look, be looking at collectively um, what, what you can do. It's sort of, those of you who have teenagers, looking at the ACT or SAT scores, you, you know, you, you, we, we, you can super score those, but you, you tend to, people tend to do better or worse on one section or the other of those scores. And what they've done is taken the best score for each and said you can achieve that as opposed to a composite score, which would be an average across your, your strengths and weaknesses. So that's a real challenge, a real opportunity that I think um, put states even that are wanting to do um, as much as they can do in looking at those building blocks saying, well, if we make investment decisions over here, it may impact what we're doing over here because there is only certain efficiencies and certain amount of capital investments you can make uh, to get those cost recoveries. Um, moving to the renewable and nuclear building block, one of the real concerns that uh, Tennessee and several other southern states particularly that are using nuclear power, um, you know, our view is this is a carbon plan, a plan to reduce carbon that EPA ought to be agnostic about what source of uh, zero carbon or low carbon um, and that their, their building blocks and their definition of best system of emission reduction should be agnostic as long as it's reducing carbon. Uh, and when you get to building block three, they built into the target those states that had nuclear power uh, units under construction like Tennessee, South Carolina, and Georgia in particular, um, they built that into the target goal saying, well, they're under construction so they're achievable even though they haven't run a day yet. Um, and they assume that the day they start they can operate at 90 percent uh, capacity factor, which if you look historically um, at nuclear power capacity, you know, that never ramps up that quickly. Uh, and because this is an average uh, uh, accumulated over years, you, you, if you start out slow, you can never catch up. It's not, a, it's not an end target, it's an average. Um, so that's a real uh, thing, just first of all, that they built that in, where they did not, if there are other wind power or solar power, just other renewable or zero carbon or low carbon units under construction in other states, those were not cooked into the target goal. Those are essentially compliant. So if Kansas or Oklahoma is building, uh, and there are some units out there in some states, if those units were under construction in another state and they were one, a, a zero carbon source, um, those essentially become uh, a bit, you know, uh, options for, for hitting the target or making additional reductions beyond the target 
it wasn't used in the definition of best system of emission reduction. So we've raised the issue with TV or with EPA of you know how do you choose arbitrarily between one zero carbon source and one, another zero carbon source and say this one gets built into your target and this one is free compliance. Um, that, in my view, has got you know some uh, uh, legal scrutiny or legal uh, questionable. Uh, there's no real rational reason why they chose you know, to, to account for under construction. And then set aside the, the other issue, just the nuclear of it's under construction, it doesn't have an NRC license yet, um, how are you automatically accounting for essentially the full capacity factor of that uh, source and if it comes online late. And we've proposed a number of alternatives to, to EPA that says you know, some cushion or two, two numbers may be dependent on whether or not that nuclear additional nuclear capacity uh, comes online. And as Ken alluded to, it really is impacts other states, is the kind of weird thing they built in the proposal to try and incent other existing units that are in relicensing and stuff uh, to maintain those operations. But again, um, people feel what they do about nuclear power versus other other low carbon sources, but um, in terms of this rule and EPA's position in developing what's the best system of emission reduction and looking at that building block three, our view is they should be agnostic about uh, zero carbon emission sources and not, not give credit differently depending on which type of, of, of zero carbon uh, generation is being done. Um, in terms of the renewable targets, um, EPA proposed two different things. Um, one is the renew a target, which was their sort of lead main proposal, was they looked at in your region, our, for us the southeast, and said, what are states around you doing in terms of renewable portfolio standard kind of requirements? And, and then said, okay, we're going to take that, um, whatever the best uh, is being done in your sort of region, recognizing there's some regional differences. Uh, and say then everybody should hit that target. And what they did is Tennessee, or North Carolina had a statute that said they were going to get 10 percent renewables by, by some date. Um, and so they put in for the southeastern states that that 10 percent target and you would make incremental improvements over time based on from where you started. The alternative proposal was really to do what I think 111D is more uh, supposed to do is you look at what's reasonable based on the facts and the circumstances of your mix of units and, and in this case of renewables, what's feasible uh, in your particular location for solar, renew uh, wind and other renewable sources. Um, and so we supported that alternative approach to look and, and do what would be a normal thing is you, what's best, best system of emission reduction for your sources within your state. Uh, it was particularly uh, a concern to us that the 10 percent number was just a legislative uh, mandate by North Carolina. Um, what, information we were able to uncover is that number actually assumed a lot of out-of-state generation. So you can't keep trading forever. As if they were going to get some percentage, let's just say half of their renewable generation from out-of-state, well, then their really in-state target would have been 5%. Um, so uh, so our, our, our comments, uh, you can see in the public record, were, were toward that we, the alternative proposal. And, and from everything we hear, I think EPA is probably leaning in that direction. Uh, because uh, so many states commented, you know, in, in different different regions got selected different targets based on what some state. Uh, and again, those were goals. Uh, much different to have a renewable portfolio standard. Many of those states, there were more goals. Um, there was no consequence for not achieving them. They were target goals um, that, that utility uh, uh, regulators were trying to shoot for, um, but not necessarily the same kind of enforceable requirements that would be in a plan uh, to be held accountable. Um, so that's um, uh, the, the, some of the issues we had in, in terms of the renewable and building block three. The building block four and the demand side reduction, uh, Ken alluded to a lot of those discussions, and that comes back to really the challenges of TBA and our electric power generating system in this state not being um, vertically integrated. That if you're really looking at putting uh, controls or permit limits and other things, on the utility units themselves, how you can get those demand side reductions. Now, that is, uh, we shouldn't be doing everything we can to try to promote energy conservation and energy efficiency, and we've certainly started to do that at the state and uh, just by leading, uh, with, within our own state um, resources. We've got 
we're one of the largest power users in the state as state as a whole and, and uh, one of the largest building owners of the state in terms of square footage when you take in account our universities and uh, state regent schools and as well as state office buildings. So we're on an effort to really put in the budget this year money to, to promote energy efficiency and demand side reduction within our state facilities. Bob's leading that effort. Um, but um, mandating that and how you make that enforceable is one of the real challenges. Uh, and that's where I think you know, we've asked for more guidance from EPA on how you can translate that and turn it into a, per into a permit condition at a utility source or some other requirement. Um, there'll be a huge uh, you know, uprising if we start attaching enforceable meters on individual homes and stuff. So we, we've got to have, uh, find a way to, to promote that um, and do that. But it's one thing to have that, uh, those voluntary initiatives and get reductions. Um, where I think there is a lot of low-hanging fruit, frankly, um, we, we as a state, in particular in the southeast as well, um, we tend to use a fairly high amount of electricity per capita. Um, so there are clearly opportunities. Um, and, and some of that's an unfortunate sort of circular psycho, cycle. Um, socioeconomically, uh, we're relatively poor states in the southeast. Um, so you tend to have, you know, you don't have, you have a lot of older homes, you have a lot of th places without insulation, you have a lot of inefficient e energy use, um, uh, but having the money and the resources to make those investments uh, is also the challenge for those um, low incomes. And so how we, how we get programs that get to where some of the most inefficient uses are in a cost-effective way. And, and we're really looking for, for partners in, in, in the community, I mean, with the NGOs and others to, to help look at ways that we can get those programs in a concrete enough way that we can get credit for those reductions um, and, 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 and to be a piece of the plan because I certainly think they, they do and, and back to the sort of original ideas, it's cheaper to reduce demand than it is to find new ways to generate a capacity um, or to con reduce the carbon emissions from that uh, generating capacity. And not only carbon emissions, we're reducing SO2 and PM and ozone, you know, all the other pollutants for which uh, EPA has, has set standards on these same same units. Um, so uh, those are big picture. A couple of those, you know, how do you, how do you bring those um, opportunities? Now, in terms of you know opportunities, I think there is some unique opportunities in the clean energy sector. Uh, Tennessee has already become a, sort of a hotbed of, of solar development and solar um, Alstom Power and others. Um, there's the, we have Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which can be a sort of um, research facility for creative and alternative energy sources. Um, and I think there's opportunities for, uh, we already have reasonably co uh, low cost power and if we can find ways to move forward uh, and, and address the carbon issue uh, and promote renewable energy technologies, that also can present opportunities not only for Tennessee but for other states that get out of the head of the curve. Because if you're looking to attract business, back to the investors, if you're looking to attract business, uh, opportunities to your state and growth um, and sustain your economic development. Uh, one of the things they want is the certainty of what you know labor costs are going to be, utility costs. I mean, what the cost of, of doing business in that state is, and the more predictability they have, uh, if you have a roadmap uh, to to reduce your carbon emissions, because 111D or not, um, whatever happens to this rule, you set aside. The general uh, movement is to reduce carbon emissions. Companies, as I said, back in the early 2000s, many companies were making that policy choice, um, you know, as much for uh, social welfare and international sort of commitments um, and, and just assuming there would be uh, carbon legislation. But um, how you move forward and if you have a st stable uh, sort of approach to uh, not only carbon emissions but, but your utility sector and a sustainable utility sector going forward, um, that actually can be a good business opportunity. And then if you have energy sectors like a, a solar power, um, whether you generate it here or not, you know, we have limited capacity, some, some opportunities for solar power, but not as much as other parts of the country. Um, but if you're a, a resource of, of that uh, solar capacity, whether making the uh, photovoltaic cells or other energy sector business and, and other uh, clean energy opportunities, you know, so that can certainly be an economic driver for your state as well. So if you're out ahead of it, um, that's, um, that's, that, those are some of the broad overviews. I'll maybe stop there. 
uh, and let folks ask questions and, and comments.